uh, and the raw free is one of the high consequence infectious diseases units here in the UK. And we were the first uh, hospital to be involved in looking after COVID-19 cases back in February this year. So we have a lot of experience of looking after patients and what we thought we should try and do today to try and share the experience, but we would also like to learn from you. So it's really important that we make this a two-way process. Um, we've got to do this in, in three short parts. Uh, Dom's going to start off with a couple of case presentations that highlight some of the challenges that we saw and learned about uh, during this pandemic. Um, Dr. Lamb's then going to take us through care bundles, in other way, other words, uh, the sorts of things that we, we kind of uh, took away from this and, and tried uh, to implement uh, as the hospital was moving forward to the pandemic. And then I'm going to finish off uh, with telling you about clinical trials in the context uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, and the studies that we were involved in and, and the experiences and perhaps some of the data that we've seen from these uh, studies. So let me start off with Dr. Wakerley, who's one of the infectious diseases trainees and registrars with us, uh, who's going to take us through a couple of case presentations. So bear with me, and we'll do this. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to start really by running through uh, two cases that sort of, um, that aren't like the straightforward COVID cases, like a number of the ones that we've seen that have just a, a slightly more complicated edges to them, uh, really. Uh, so I'll start with this first case that we saw on the ward. So he is, oh, how do I change that? Yeah, here we go. A 53-year-old man uh, who was admitted with 14 days, so quite a long history of fevers, lethargy, and cough. Um, he's got a background of multiple sclerosis, but actually he was pretty fit and well and quite independent before all this. Um, and other than that, had no real past medical history or any significant medications. Um, his heart rate was borderline tachycardic when he came in. His blood pressure was, was okay, about 103 over 69. Um, and his respiratory rate wasn't too bad, but he was desaturating slightly, of sets of 89%. Um, which improved quite quickly with just a few litres of oxygen. Yeah, he was febrile at the time and he had some crackles on his chest. And the impression was very much of, of COVID and the symptoms that he gave us. Um, his blood showed uh, quite significant uh, inflammation. He had a uh, raised white cell count with neutrophils of 13.8 and he had a CRP of 194. Um, his troponin was 11, but, and, but his D-dimer was raised at nearly 5,000. But then at the time, that was sort of thought to be in context of the fact that he had COVID and possibly a, a superimposed bacterial infection. Um, his swab for SARS-CoV-2 came back positive. So this is pretty poor quality x-ray. I'm hoping that you might be able to see some bits of it. But overall, it's not a very clear picture. There's, on the right basis, maybe some changes that could be uh, suggestive of COVID. But there's no sort of um, classic global consolidation really seen. So he was given levofloxacin for possible bacterial pneumonia. He was given some thromboprophylaxis while he was here, and he was initially on a little bit of oxygen, but actually he came off the oxygen quite quickly and appeared to get better fairly quickly. So he would, seemed to be quite a straightforward case and was discharged two days later. However, he returned the next day, uh, still with the cough, feeling more short of breath, and with some right-sided pleuritic pain. Um, his observations weren't too different. His, he was still slightly tachycardic. His blood pressure was about the same. His respiratory rate was slightly higher. Um, he was still desaturating slightly, and he was on three liters of oxygen when he came in. His fever, however, had got better. He still had some crackles on his chest, much like a few days before. So his blood test showed that his, the inflammation side of things at least was improving. The white cells were now normal. Uh, the CRP was certainly better, down from 194 when his previous admission. The troponin was still fine, but the D-dimer was still raised. So he actually went straight to have a CTPA, but his concern was whether or not he had a, a, a PE. So, and you can see here on this, um, this is uh, one of the cuts of the, the CTPA that he had. There's some like sort of thick consolidation and some minor pool effusions, but actually it's these, uh, two large PEs that are the, 
the causative problem here. Um, so he was uh, treated with uh, tinzaparin uh, initially, and actually his symptoms again improved quite quickly. He came off oxygen fairly quickly, and he was discharged home on rivaroxaban. The plan for him was uh, to be anticoagulated for at least three months, um, but we're still a little bit unclear over how long we'll, we'll complete anticoagulation for. But he's going to be seen in a hematology clinic before that comes to an end, that duration. So the reason I, we, we picked this case is um, mainly because uh, peas are such a common occurrence. We're getting a number of people coming in uh, with very classic COVID symptoms, but actually they also have this, these peas going on. So this is another lady on the same ward, uh, an 83 year old, uh, she was admitted with shortness of breath. And you can see from the x-ray that she's got enough to be short of breath about really with that bilateral uh, patchy consolidation, which is pretty classical for COVID. But she also had a, a PE. Um, so there's a lot of dual pathology that we're seeing here. So our CTPA guidance at the time of uh, this first case that I presented was, um, we would do a CTPA if there's clinical suspicion or if there's unexplained sinus tachycardia, new onset of arrhythmia, usually something like atrial fibrillation. If they were becoming short of breath or desaturating on exercise much more than you would expect, uh, if there's any evidence of right axis deviation on the ECG, uh, if there was any syncope with hemodynamic compromise. And at the time, our threshold was for a D-dimer of 5,000, although in the wake of such cases, we've dropped that to 2,000. But it's still very much, um, if you think there's a, any sort of clinical suspicion now that we're going, they're so common that we're going down the path of um, scanning. So I just had a look at some of, there's quite a few studies looking at the incidence of PE in COVID, and they're all a little bit flawed from a methodology point of view. Um, but as you can see, the prevalence is pretty high from uh, something between 20 to 27%, generally more common in intensive care. Um, so we don't know the exact real um, incidence or prevalence of PEs in these cases, but, but the message is basically that they're very common and they're very high. Um, and some London hospitals have actually gone as far as uh, just anticoagulation, anticoagulating all COVID admissions. But I don't think as far as I'm aware we've got much data from that yet. So that's something to keep an eye out for. So uh, now to move on to the second case. So this was also a 53-year-old man. So he had a shorter history of just five days of myalgia, weakness, and fever, and just a little bit of diarrhea as well. Um, but more recently, he developed some chest pain uh, and shortness of breath in the previous two days. Sort of left-sided, um, not radiating, sort of comes and goes, but no clear cause for it, and no sort of triggering factors that he could work out. And actually, by the time he came into hospital and was being seen by us, he was pain-free. He didn't really have any past medical history at all, but he was a little bit tachycardic when we saw him, and his blood pressure was a bit on the low side, so that should be 95 over 63 there. Um, his respiratory rate was a little bit up, but he was saturating very well, unlike a lot of the other COVID patients that we see, um, and his, he was afebrile. His examination was actually pretty unremarkable. So these are the ECGs that when he came in, um, and there's actually, as, as a non-cardiologist, I would say it pretty much just looks like a sinus tachycardia. So that's his first one, and this is his second one. There's no real um, clear ST changes. There's no real uh, worrying T-wave inversion particularly seen. Um, so the general feeling was that um, maybe he had something alongside the lines of just usual COVID or PE or something like that, but then his blood test came back. Um, so again, there was quite a lot of information seen with raised white cell count and CRP. But the striking thing here in his blood test was that his troponin was 819, which is extremely raised. The, the normal here is about 14. So uh, he had a repeat, which was also raised at 850, and he was positive for coronavirus. So the impression in this case was that he had a, a myocardial infarction in the context of having COVID. He was started on aspirin and ticagrelor, and he had a bedside echo, which showed a moderately impaired left ventricular function, and possibly uh, some hypokinesis at the apex and posterior wall. The next day, however, he uh, started to deteriorate fairly quickly. Um, he desaturated quite a lot. He had a CTPA, which showed no PE, but it did show ground glass changes consistent with the 
the appearance of COVID, but he continued to deteriorate and actually ended up being intubated on the ward. Um, he had a PE arrest just minutes after that, which lasted for about four minutes. He was given one dose of adrenaline and he, he came back and was transferred to the intensive care unit. So this was his admission x-ray and then this was the x-ray um, in, in intensive care uh, shortly after the arrest. So as you can see, this isn't your sort of your typical COVID appearances. This is more of a, a pulmonary edema in the context of somebody who, you know, has just had an arrest. So while he was on intensive care, he required dobutamine to keep up his blood pressure. Um, a bedside echo done there showed some mildly impaired uh, systolic function again. Um, pretty normal right ventricle, but some impaired systolic function again. But actually, he improved relatively quickly with supportive care and was uh, discharged to the ward after three days. So his cardiac MRI, which was done um, about a week after he was discharged from intensive care, unfortunately I don't have the images because it was done at a different hospital, but it showed actually normal left ventricular function now um, and no regional wall -like motion abnormalities. But the key finding really is that he had this sub-epicardial late gadolinium enhancement um, and some myocardial edema. And that's consistent with myocarditis. Essentially what the, the MRI was showing was that there was inflammation of the heart without actually an, any evidence of any scarring that would be caused by an ischemic event. So this is a case of COVID myocarditis rather than um, an MI like it had initially been thought. So this is another case that was reported. So just showing you some of the images um, from it here. So on the top, you can see the, the ventricles uh, are very white, which is um, quite unusual, which is sort of exact, most clearly shown in, in the, the middle two um, slides. So that's a pretty classic sign of myocarditis really. And that's what we've been seeing some of the COVID patients we've had. So, in this case, um, his aspirin and ticagrelor were stopped. Um, he was started on Ramipol by Soprolol, which was up-titrated while he was here. Um, he had a myocarditis screen for other viruses that could have caused this, but that all came back normal. Um, and actually, he was discharged home and was actually very well when he was sent home on the, um, just uh, a few days after the MRI. The plan is for him to have a, another MRI in three months, and it will be monitored closely after that. So this sort of myocarditis is actually being seen uh, quite commonly. There's quite a few case reports in the literature. This is just one that I picked out. Um, another 69 year old man with hypertension. Um, the similarities are that he had a very high troponin when he came in and actually he was in acute respiratory distress and required intubation. And he had the similar cardiac MRI findings. But in this chap, which we didn't catch in our patients, is that he had diffuse T wave inversion on some of his ECGs with some dynamic changes. And they were able to do angiography, which we didn't do here for this patient, that showed normal coronary vessels. So just my final slide, um, just about COVID and the heart. The European Society of Cardiology here has um, quite a few points that it's um, made about the um, cardiac issues relating to COVID. So essentially, uh, as we already know, there's a lot of um, issues with uh, some cardiovascular risk factors that can increase the risk of death from COVID, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and ischemic heart disease. But also it looks like elevated troponin is an independently significant um, risk factor for higher mortality in patients being admitted. And some of the issues that have been seen in COVID patients include cardiac arrhythmias, myocarditis, and acute MIs, even in the context of normal coronary vessels. And there's also some concern over having long-term uh, cardiovascular risk increased as a result of having COVID. Okay, thank you very much. Great, so that's uh, fantastic. And, and just a, a, an illustration of a couple of cases of things that we didn't know about at the beginning of this pandemic. In other words, you know, the, the, the presumption was that this was gonna be uh, a viral pneumonitis, uh, ARDS and hypoxia with all the attendant complications of that. Uh, but as the pandemic progressed, we learned that, you know, this is a, a virus that has predilection uh, for a number of different organ systems and that, you know, endothelial inflammation seems to be one of the hallmarks uh, of uh, the pathophysiology of this infection uh, and that pulmonary embolism and myocarditis uh, are beginning to be recognized uh, as common complications.
uh, of COVID-19. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Lam, who's going to tell us about care bundles uh, here at the Royal Free Hospital and how what we've learned has made us change in terms of what we do for patients that have been admitted uh, with suspected COVID-19. So bear with me whilst I try and uh, get the next set of slides on. So, share screen again. It's just a moment. Okay, so Dr. Lam. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Sanjay. Thank you. It's lovely to be invited to speak to you all this afternoon. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about care of COVID and the Royal Free and how we've instituted the bundle sort of theme and the background behind this. And it all sort of started back in March. And um, the story started back with me being invited to the um, clinical guidance, sit on the clinical guidance committee for the trust. And um, sitting with one of my colleagues in the infectious disease department, thinking about how we were going to manage large cohorts of patients with minimal contact and also refine our learning throughout this whole process. At that point in time, we were unaware of how many patients we'd actually have through the front doors of the Royal Free and what kit and people that we'd have available to us. So the background behind this, and I really drew on some experience that I'd had um, sort of around about four, to six years ago and my experience came from working out in Sierra Leone with the um, military and I was working out in an Ebola treatment centre where we first um, sort of first had our first attempts of looking at a protocol approach to clinical care and management mainly with the main principles that what we wanted to do was optimise our clinical contact time when we went into the Ebola treatment unit both from a nursing and also from a medical doctor perspective. There was also at that point in time that I went out to Sierra Leone, a lack of disease understanding and a lack of understanding about a disease that was emerging as a um, um, epidemic within Sierra Leone. And also, we also wanted to enhance our learning throughout the whole process. And we had a regular review of our protocol management at that point in time. As a new group of people came into the treatment unit, we'd update our bundle and update our management of those patients. And as new and emerging treatments and trials came through, that process also got updated. So this was really kind of the basis of some of my thinking about how we've managed patients coming through the door of the Royal Free, particularly if we had large cohorts of patients. And I sat with one of my colleagues, Rachel Moores, and we kind of started the first bundles and the initial first bundles were actually produced to look at, first of all, suspected and confirmed cases and to manage their care. And we're now on the fourth version of the bundle, which I've named Care of COVID-19 Royal Free Hospital. And the fourth versions, the versions have gone through sort of three or four different changes as we learn more about the disease, both locally, nationally, and also internationally, as more publications have come through. So the document basically should be used as a practical guide um, and it should be used not to teach clinicians how to do medicine or to practice medicine, but just to give them some guidance what's around available for them, both locally, nationally and also internationally. It's to enable us as we change our Juno doctor cohort to update our new Juno staff and how we like to manage our patients and what the and source of signpost them to some local management and also some other publications. One of the things we've learned from um, the bundle is that we must have a clear treatment and escalation plan for all our patients both managing them from an end-of-life care point of view, but also managing them on an escalation point of view. Those patients that should be appropriate for ICU support, those patients that are more appropriately managed on the ward. And every case and every patient is documented clearly within the notes, documented with the patient if they have capacity or with a named contact. And this has been through the ethical committee of the trust, but also with the guidance committee as well. 
So we, at, like any good um, infectious disease, we like to have an inpatient case definition. And obviously, as many of us are aware, it's the clinical or radiological evidence of pneumonia or acute respiratory distress syndrome or an influenza-like illness. And this case definition originally came from the WHO guidance that was published in March. And additions to it have also come from Public Health England with the recent addition of the lack of smell and the loss of taste are included. There's important note that atypical symptoms, and we found this amongst our patient cohort, occur in the elderly and also in those that are immunosuppressed. So initially, because we had little understanding of the disease process and little understanding of actually how we were going to manage these patients, we sought our guidance from the World Health Organization and their initial guidance was published in March. And they initially defined um, the process as mild, moderate, and also severe disease, with severe disease ending up in intensive care, which I won't discuss today. They've now re-updated that guidance, which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with, and that guidance came out at the end of May. And what I'll go on to discuss here today is how we manage that moderate disease, those patients that are coming in with clinical signs of pneumonia into the trust. So as we're well aware, the risk factor profile has become more, um, um, more understanding, more understanding has become um, apparent in the risk profile with a recent publication from our UK cohort um, talking about the number of risk factors here, which I've highlighted in red. And there's ongoing work at looking at some of the others as well. And I won't go into the nitty gritty of these, but it's just to make you aware of the current main risk factors for people attending and some of the main presentations that we saw had some of these risk factors involved. So some of the typical results that were published originally in March and February time, which came out of some of the data and publications from China, particularly from the Wuhan data, talk about, as many of us are aware, lymphopenia, transaminitis, erased in our CRP. And I'll go into a little bit of guidance how we've refined some of our antibiotic policies as a result of some of the results that we've seen through. Acute kidney injury, the WHO guidance always talk about careful fluid resuscitation and we're looking into acute kidney injury at the moment amongst a cohort of raw free patients that we're seeing large numbers of patients present with an acute kidney injury and we're concerned that actually fluid might be important at the point of those patients coming into our emergency department. As, um, um, as Dom has raised in a really nice case presentation on his second slide, talking about the raise in creatinine kinase and particularly that rise in troponin. And our cardiology colleagues are currently looking at some of the cardiac MRI data on a small group of patients, around 80 to 100 of them, looking at whether they had a non STEMI or myocarditis. And these are patients that were COVID positive and that have been followed up one to two weeks later. We've brought up the um, sort of the relationship between the D-dimer and whether patients are getting a positive CTPA. And we've been able to with um, refine some of our admission criteria, also based on clinical presentation on that. And then there's the usual imaging that also gets taken. So we now actually have an order set at the Royal Free, which we can order at the emergency department, which is a blood test order set, which I've shown you here, which is typically what we would take for most of our patients. And that order set has been refined as we've gone through a number of iterations of the bundle, depending on the results and the patient cohort we have seen, with additions made to it by colleagues in other departments. So mild illness, as many of you are aware, we've been managing mild illness um, and our emergency department see these patients and often are discharging them home or they're not actually entering our hospital department. And we've got some guidance on how patients can manage themselves at home, both from a symptom point of view and also when they should represent to our hospital. So we've come through to now June and we've gone through different ways of learning about the disease and ways of managing COVID-19. And we've kind of, between myself and other colleagues in other departments, which have included um, our diabetologists in our endocrine department, managing patients with diabetes and COVID, 
through to emergency department, through to the radiologist giving advice, we've come up with a care of COVID for the raw free pathway, which gives some, which is based on some evidence locally, but also based on international data that's emerging. And I just wanted to take you through just that pathway with you. So it starts really with the care of COVID. And obviously we all know that it's you, our choice of personal protective equipment is um, important for managing these patients. And the majority of patients that we manage on the wards have been managed with just using a surgical mask, gloves and an apron, with the principles that this is a contact or air droplet spread virus. Those patients that need resuscitation or more intensive management on ICU um, require us to don further elements of PP and we're moving some, with some patients to wearing visors and gowns and um, an other aspect of masks and apron. And we've had some recent resuscitation council guidance published on that. We obviously need to assess our patients, resuscitate them pro properly, and then I've been through the escalation plan of how to manage patients, particularly we've got some really good guidance from our palliative care and also our, our um, nursing colleagues on how to manage patients at the end of life care. And I kind of draw on experiences that I was um, situated in the photo you saw at the beginning of my presentation was a picture actually from the early morning of, um, one of uh, finishing one of the night shifts on the 12th floor. And a large proportion of our patients, I would say between 20 and 30% of our patients were on a ward-based or end-of-life care pathway during that period of time. And so it was really vitally important that we had good communication with relatives who weren't able to visit our patients, good end-of-life care pathways, and also appropriate escalation plans for these people as well. So there was a um, there was a time at the Royal Free between March and April, and for those of you, we were in a hospital drama shown on um, BBC Two, illustrating the challenges that we had from procurement. And one of the challenges was procurement of um, oxygen, as well as other um, fluids, including dialysis fluid and also antibiotics. And alongside our ICU colleagues scattered around London, some optimization of our oxygenation uses was made um, during that period. We also have learned that we can also prone patients, and this is an example of a patient being proned in a kind of cartoon picture. Um, we can prone our patients on the ward and they can get some good outcomes from this measure. It's important to give adequate hydration, and we've learned this from the acute injury um, um, figures that are coming out with our patient cohort. And some of them are managed by our respiratory colleagues with um, non-invasive ventilation. Fluids and feeding became more important as we were learning about our patients with a large portion of them requiring mm -hmm. oxygen. And we had some guidance on that, which was supported by our colleagues in the renal department. The nutrition team um, provided some guidance on how we would feed both the patients that can take oral fluids and those that weren't able to on how we could start NG feeding as well. Diabetes was a really interesting area and I note that from the WHO guidance published in May they haven't really touched on this and I would actually argue alongside my colleagues um, from the endocrine department who published um, a nice um, summary of how to manage the diabetic COVID positive patient that we saw a number of patients come in, not only with um, either DKA or a hyperosmolar picture, but also those with youth glycemic ketoacidosis. And we produced some guidance about what medicines we should stop and what medicines we should continue as they were in the initial stages of their illness. With colleagues and registrars from the infection department, it has been a great pleasure to work with them and look through our antibiotic guidance. We were initially using a lot of antibiotics and we're looking into studies to refine that usage and I'll show you a slide on that in a moment. Um, as Dom has kindly mentioned in his presentation with the first case, we've now managed to refine some of our guidance based on clinical characterization of the patient and the concern of the clinician that we end up scanning a number of patients when their D-dimer is raised above a certain level. And we found from those scans that have been done, nearly sort of 50% of those patients have a positive um, scan with a pulmonary embolus. 
then it's also important to go through the drug chart and think about the discharge of our patients. And we're now looking at how we follow up these patients, both from the respiratory point of view, but also from the psychological and physiotherapy point of view. And the team from the respiratory team have been involved in that process. And I know that Sanjay is going to talk to you about trial drugs, so I won't talk about that in more depth. So this is the latest sort of example of our prescribing antibiotics. Initially, when our patients were coming in, we didn't understand the disease process and antibiotics were given at the front door. And the procurement of those became slightly tricky, so we had to change our guidance. Now we're able to more clearly refine those patients that get antibiotics and give them in a more stewardship-friendly way. And I've just um, shown you the um, sort of diagram diagram of how we're doing that and we're now going to look at a cohort of patients with flu bacterial pneumonia and with COVID to see if there's any way we can refine that process even more so we're moving on to the last bit of our care of COVID-19 rule free guidance we look at obviously doing imaging and we've talked through that process of what imaging that we could do in that patient cohort talked about the importance of how we're contacting family either virtually by phone um, with a no visitor policy now happening within the trust, it's important that we keep in contact with our family members. And then the WHO really dwell on this holistic care of patients and making sure they're followed up, particularly from the psychological side of things. And some of my colleagues in that department are being involved in that. So I, I, I wasn't going to talk on the critical disease at ICU and producing their own guidance, but I just really wanted to just summarise that I've been very lucky to work with a number of people in a number of departments to really refine our guidance at the Royal Free, and it's been a real pleasure to work with those people. As we all know, the clinical care of COVID-19 patients is a rapidly progressive field, and as we go along, we're trying to keep up with that new data emerging and those new publications that are coming through. The bundle allows us to have a protocol of care plan for managing patients and particularly a large number of patients and it also allows us to set standards for auditing those patient cohorts as well. So thank you very much. Thank you Lucy, that was really fantastic and so you know that was a, 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 a tour of um, how we're doing things here at the Royal Free. Um, I'm just going to get on to the next presentation uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll open up for questions after that, if that's okay with you. Um, so let's just see if I can bring this up. Okay, so what we've seen so far is case presentations of things that we learned about uh, during the pandemic. We also looked at um, care of patients from, you know, coming through our doors to leaving in terms of uh, uh, appropriate investigations and appropriate uh, uh, standard of care. The next thing we wanted to explore uh, was whilst we were uh, providing the, the most excellent in, 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 in terms of standard of care, what could we do about specific therapies for COVID-19? And so uh, the, the, the next arm of our response was clinical trials. We made a decision right very early in, in, into the pandemic that we were not going to treat people outside of clinical trials because there was no evidence base for doing that. Um, so just to recap, and, and everybody knows this, that for the vast majority of patients uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infection, the infection is mild and is self-resolving. There is a small percentage of, of patients that become symptomatic and might need hospital uh, uh, admission, uh, and an even smaller percentage, around 15%, that, that, that uh, have severe illness that will require either oxygen supportive therapy or, or critical illness that will require intensive care support and mechanical ventila ventilation or ECMO. So this is the, the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. And as you can see, there are a number of potential targets for antiviral therapies within this life cycle. Uh, and you, you can see right at the bottom there is uh, where your specific antivirals become really important. So this is agents like remdesivir, favipiravir, and possibly even ribavirin. 
And so we decided uh, that we were going to get involved with uh, both interventional and non-interventional studies here at the Royal Free Hospital from an academic point of view. Of the non-interventional studies, we thought it was really important that, that we were part of the WHO ISARIC uh, collaboration. Uh, we also took part in a study called Genomic that was trying to understand the genetic outcomes uh, or outcomes related to, to genetic makeup uh, and a study called Inhale, which was looking um, at bacterial pathogens in the context of uh, COVID-19. The interventional trials are the ones on the right. Uh, and again, we chose very, very carefully here in terms of what agents we thought were going to be useful and so we were involved in the Gilead registration trials for remdesivir. Covacta is a tocilizumab study. CanCOVID is a canicunumab study. PACA is a local trial of nebulized TPA. Uh, and then we have two platform national studies that uh, we didn't get hugely involved in, but uh, are recruiting here at the Royal Free in small numbers. So Whilst you will know there are a number of repurposed drugs uh, in, in clinical trials for SARS-CoV-2, what we thought was important was to try and, and work out, you know, what uh, is an agent that is likely to work and what isn't. And, and in this regards, we think there's a number of different modes of evidence you need before something goes into clinical trials. First of all, you need to have biological possibility that this is going to work. Uh, and this is usually done in, in silico or computer modeling studies. You then need to put uh, the, the potential drugs through uh, in vitro data, and this is you know, blockade of viral replication in cell culture systems. Preferably, you should have some small animal or non-human primate data, and even more preferably, activity in similar viral infections. And, and here we have two other beta coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, and so uh, a number of agents have been used for those too. Uh, and then before we put stuff into um, clinical trials, it is important to have human safety data. And I put that line at the bottom of that slide that just because something is readily available and it is cheap, or it's been proclaimed by a world leader, does not make it an ideal candidate uh, to be put into large clinical trials. Uh, so the first agent I wanted to explore was remdesivir um, and wanted to see if remdesivir met any of these criteria uh, before being introduced into clinical trials. So you all know remdesivir is an intravenous nucleotide broad drug that has broad antiviral activity against RNA viruses uh, and has established human safety data in Ebola virus infection. In fact, that was where it was first used uh, in humans. We also have some in vitro uh, data in terms of activity against SARS-CoV-2 uh, in cell culture systems. And most importantly for me, I think there was uh, macaque data in terms of macaque's challenge with SARS-CoV-2 where it reduced infectious virus in Pogjavila lavage and protected from respiratory disease. Uh, so there have been a number of randomized control trials that have either uh, fully reported or reported partially or are ongoing in a large compassionate use program from Gilead Sciences uh, that also recruited in the early days. We're just going to very briefly look through results of four trials, many of which you have seen already. So I'm not going to dwell on these in great big detail, uh, but these give us an idea of whether remdesivir works uh, for SARS-CoV-2 or not. Uh, but before we do that, I think it is also important for you to understand that there are some overarching principles for randomized control trials uh, for COVID-19. So the trials are either uh, single agent parallel arm studies or adaptive platform trials. Adaptive platform trials have become uh, very fashionable uh, in the context of uh, big epidemics and pandemics. Adaptive platform trials are either two or multiple arms uh, tested all together with either a control which is standard of care or a, a, a placebo, in which case is either double blind or open label. The primary endpoint for all of these studies is either death by a given time point, and in the, in the context of COVID-19, this is 
day 28, usually all clinical improvement and clinical improvement is based on a clinical ordinal scale. And this is, these are ordinal scales that range from six to eight points. Uh, and then you, you define clinical improvement as improvement by two points at given time points, either at day 14, day 28, day 11, or time to recovery, which is not requiring oxygen or being discharged from hospital. So let's firstly look at the China randomized control trial. This was the first randomized control trial of remdesivir uh, versus uh, uh, placebo. Uh, this was in hospitalized patients who required oxygen, uh, so with oxygen saturations of less than 94% within 12 days of onset of symptoms. And this was a two to one randomization to receive either remdesivir uh, or uh, placebo. And as you can see in the kaplan meyer plot at the bottom on the left, whilst there seems to be some difference between the remdesivir and the control arm with a, a hazard ratio of 1.23, this did not meet statistical significance. And this was because this study was hugely underpowered to do this. So it stopped after 237 hospitalized patients and the, the study was powered to recruit up to 450 patients. Perhaps more importantly, and we can discuss this in detail if you want to later, if you look at the graphs on the right-hand side, time to become undetectable, either in nasopharyngeal uh, swabs or in sputum, was no different between the remdesivir uh, and the control groups. And so there was, whilst there was hints that remdesivir uh, may reduce uh, time to recovery, uh, this was proven by this study. It was the next study that perhaps was the most influential in, in deciding that remdesivir works for um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. This was the NIH-led ACT trial. Uh, this was a large uh, randomized uh, double-blind placebo control trial of over a thousand hospitalized patients uh, with COVID-19 as proven by a positive PCR. On the left hand side, you can see this was a study population that required either supplemental oxygen therapy mostly or high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation. So this was a, 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 a sick population that was hospitalized with COVID-19. The results can be summarized in this one slide. If you look at the left hand slide uh, graphic, the, the median time to recovery uh, was five days quicker for remdesivir compared to placebo. And then this was statistically significant. Uh, if you look at mortality estimates at the bottom, whilst there was a trend towards reduced mortality in, in the remdesivir arm compared to placebo, uh, this did not meet statistical significance. And the reason for this is that this trial was not designed to show a mortality benefit, but was designed uh, to show time to recovery. If you look at the Kaplan-Meier plots uh, on the right-hand side, uh, by subgroups, you can see the groups that were most likely to benefit were the groups that required oxygen, but not the groups that required mechanical ventilation or ECMO. And so there was a, a definite suggestion from this study that remdesivir was associated with improvement clinically in those patients that were not too unwell, but were unwell enough to either uh, require admission to hospital or, or require oxygen at admission. The next trial, uh, this was one of the ones that we were involved in. This is the Gilead 5773 trial. This was a, an open label randomized parallel arm trial of two arms. Uh, five days or 10 days uh, of remdesivir in patients with severe COVID-19 and severe was defined as having chest x-ray or CT changes associated with low oxygen saturations uh, of less than 94% or requiring supplemental oxygen. In fact, mechanically ventilated patients were excluded from the randomized phase of this trial at the primary endpoint was clinical status on a seven point ordinal scale at day 14. The bottom run line result of this study was that an improvement in more than two points was no different between the five day versus the 10 days of remdesivir suggesting for the vast majority of patients 
five days of therapy uh, would be enough. Uh, there is an interesting point in this study, which is to look at subgroups that might benefit from extension to 10 days of therapy. And if you just concentrate on the bar graphs on the left, so this is baseline uh, after five days of intravenous remdesivir and then outcomes if those patients stopped at five days or continued on to 10 days of treatment. And as you can see on the, on the left-hand side, those patients that progressed on to mechanical ventilation whilst receiving remdesivir had a benefit, at least in terms of mortality, if they continued therapy out to 10 days. The last study, which has not yet been published fully yet, but has been press released, is uh, the Gilead 5774 trial. This is another study that we were involved in, which is looking at uh, moderate COVID-19, in other words, hospitalized patients not requiring oxygen, and then being randomized to five days versus 10 days, and this time with a standard of care arm as well. Um, the primary outcome measure was clinical improvement at day 11. And in this particular study, clinical improvement at day 11 was statistically significantly better in the five-day remdesivir arm compared to the standard of care arm. So what conclusions can we make? We can certainly say that remdesivir has antiviral activity and that there is clinical benefit associated uh, with treating non-critical COVID-19 patients that this may extend to critical COVID-19 patients, although longer follow-up may be required. And that on the basis of this, five days of therapy is sufficient for the vast majority, uh, whilst 10 days in those progressing uh, on therapy. And on the basis of all of this data, the MHRA, which is our uh, licensing organization, has granted a positive opinion for early access to medicine scheme uh, for remdesivir uh, for patients hospitalized with COVID-19. So that is remdesivir. The other trial we were involved in is tocilizumab, uh, a single dose repeated after eight to 24 hours if necessary. This trial hasn't reported as yet, but will report by the end of this month, beginning of July. So we await these results with interest. Uh, and I'm also just going to very briefly take you through the big national trial that we're doing in the UK called the recovery trial that we haven't been involved in. This is a, a multiple uh, platform study with a number of agents, uh, but does not include remdesivir. And just to show you uh, that this trial recently uh, stopped its hydroxychloroquine arms uh, after more than 3,000 uh, patients being enrolled onto the hydroxychloroquine arm on the basis that there was no effect of hydroxychloroquine in terms of mortality at day 28. And I think this is now probably a, a nail in the coffin for hydroxychloroquine in terms of not using hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19. The other study that is ongoing and I think is, is available in Kenya is the WHO's Solidarity Trial, which is also a multiple uh, adaptive platform study, and this time includes remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, Kaletra, and Kaletra plus subcut interferon beta. So what's the status of all our other studies? Uh, Covacta will report by the end of June, early July. Gilead 5773 will do an analysis with a comparator group. We have another study of Kanakunumab that's still recruiting. Our study of nebulized TPA is still recruiting. Uh, and then we will see the final results of recovery probably very, very soon. So I'm going to stop there. We'll take off by screen sharing, and then perhaps we can think about a discussion and questions at this stage. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay and team. Sorry for that um, background noise.
um, that was a really, really, really good presentation. And um, we've actually learned a lot. My take home, I think for me is on the care bundle for COVID-19. And I think that makes it easy even for healthcare workers in the front line to actually manage COVID-19 patients. Um, I would hand over to Dr. Kimutia to ask his question. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for that very nice presentation. My question was more to do with the home-based care. Uh, for those patients who are to be managed at home, uh, what, how do you monitor? What tools are you using? How is it being done? Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Lam, who's been involved in some pathways for home care as well. So let me say thanks. So I think, I think the main thing to mention on the home care side of things is our focus has been really around um, working with our emergency care colleagues. Um, and they've produced some good um, discharge um, leaflets for the patients that come through our emergency department. And obviously this isn't taking into account the patients that are seen by our community care colleagues, so our general practitioners. Um, so they produce leaflets basically to give um, patients going home information on how to represent to hospital. And if they're concerned their symptoms might be getting worse, they might be getting a worsening of their fever, or they might be desaturating on um, either air or on exercise. And one of the things that was given were saturation probes to a number of patients that we were concerned about at the front door. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments to add to that as well. So, yeah, and I think that's really important. It, it, in other words, you need to identify your high risk group. And we've learned through this pandemic that there are certain people that are high risk in terms of progressive illness. And so this is your older patient with comorbidities. And this is particularly a group that if they're having home care, you need to be able in some way to either communicate with the patient very regularly or for them to be able to communicate with you if there should be deterioration uh, in their signs and symptoms. And I think oxygen saturation probes were very helpful for us. You know, you can get these now on your iPhone as a, a free app from the Apple Store. Uh, and so I think this is, this is a particularly useful tool uh, if you're monitoring people at home. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, that is very insightful. Have you, um, there's a question here from Dindi Wasoi in terms of whether you've managed um, pregnant women with COVID and how's that um, in terms of the care bundle, does it change anything or the management still remains? So um, personally, I didn't, I didn't get involved actually in seeing patients who were pregnant, but sitting on the guidance committee and I'll move to others for their thoughts. Um, there were a number of different guidelines that were produced um, during the period of time by both our maternity, paediatric, and also obstetric colleagues and um, on the management of these patients. From a clinical care point of view, I don't think the management differed hugely. We'd go through the normal process of managing these patients. I don't know if anyone had experience of working on the wards with them. So, yeah, and, 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 and I think Dr. Lam's absolutely right in, in that, you know, we have already seen data and, and certainly our experience here suggests that uh, uh, pregnant women tend not to uh, have any adverse uh, effect of, of being infected with, with COVID-19. There's clearly issues around uh, transmission risks for their neonates. Uh, and so these were the things that, that our obstetricians, uh, together with our infection control team, uh, were mostly concerned about. But I have to say, you know, we've, we've had a number of pregnancies come through uh, the last three months without any significant problems. Um, this is uh, to Dr. Lance. Um, the, a number of people are asking whether you could um, put up the slide for the care bundle for COVID-19, even as you're answering questions so they can be able to read through that. Um, there's a question from. Okay, from we'll share that with you. So just bear with us. 
open it again. In the in the meantime, I'll ask a question that's been asked by Anthony Uching. Mm -hmm. um, has there been incidents of reinfection um, once someone has recovered from COVID nineteen, and is that what's what's the prognosis after reinfection, and in terms of management that? Okay, can you still hear us? Yes, we can. We can hear you. So I, I have to say that, that in our experience, reinfection has not been an issue. Um, so, you know, we have seen people with prolonged uh, viremias, and this is especially in the context of, of people with B cell uh, immune problems uh, and late inflammatory response. Uh, but to my knowledge, we have not seen anybody with a, a, a second infection. In other words, anybody who's been positive uh, to start with persistently lose virus and then come back in with a second infection. Um, and, and I'm not sure that, that there is anything in the world literature apart from maybe a, a, a few cases where we don't know whether this was intermittent shedding or prolonged viremia, or whether it, for, in fact, was true reinfection. Um, thank you very much. Um, a question from PC Omondi. He's requesting whether you can expound on um, how ethnicity is a risk factor for COVID-19. Um, during the discussion, you said ethnicity is a risk factor. So how is that um, a risk factor? So right, right from the, the early days of the pandemic, we recognized, at least uh, on our intensive care unit here, that there was a disproportionately higher patients of um, Asian and Afro-Caribbean uh, ethnic origin on our intensive care compared to the, the, the general population that we look after here in North Central London. We're a, a very uh, middle class, uh, white suburban um, kind of neighborhood here in, at the Royal Free Hospital. And it was very surprising for us to see uh, a large number of, of patients of, of uh, um, African and Asian uh, ethnicity on our intensive care unit. Uh, this has been uh, shown over and over again in multi-ethnic societies. And in fact, there was a very nice paper from East London uh, that is uh, in pre-publication at the moment, uh, which shows that e even if you account for uh, other comorbidities, so diabetes, hypertension, renal disease, and you account for um, social class and employment, even if you take all of those out, ethnicity still seems to play a role in terms of progression to severe illness. Now, we don't know whether this is genetically linked or not, and whether this is down to ACE gene polymorphisms. Our genomic study will tell us this for sure uh, in weeks and months to come. Um, I, I'll, I'll hand over to my colleagues if, if anybody else has any uh, comments to make on this. I think you summarized it very nicely, Sanjay. I hope that helps. Um, thank you very much. I'll give an opportunity to Dr. Francisca to ask her question, kindly unmute yourself and ask. In the meantime, I'd like to ask a question whether, or in terms of stigma, um, have, while managing COVID-19 patients, have there been any cases of stigma to the healthcare workers or to the patients themselves? And how has this been handled in your setup? I will start off and then again hand over to my colleagues for, for uh, further comments. But when we first started seeing cases uh, of COVID-19, there was a fair amount of stigma associated with this because it was unknown and people were scared. 
uh, and this was true not only of um, patients with COVID-19, but also healthcare workers who were uh, looking after these patients. As the pandemic progressed and we went into lockdown, uh, almost every household uh, in London at least uh, knew of somebody who had been infected with COVID-19. And as the pandemic has progressed, this stigma has lifted quite a lot. And in fact, we're now going the other way. Now that we're doing antibody testing, people are asking whether you're antibody positive or not. In other words, you know, have you been exposed to the virus and are you going to be protected now that you, you've got antibodies or not? So, so things have gone from one direction right over to the other side. You know, people are in fact even talking about COVID-19 passports now, whether, you know, if you have antibodies, you have the passport to be able to go freely on public transport, etc. So things have moved on. And I'm hoping uh, that in countries like Kenya, we will go through that same process. Whilst it's very scary to start with, and there's a lot of stigma associated with this, as uh, we move through this, things will get better. I think um, one of the other things that has changed maybe in the last two months is that people uh, suddenly have learned a bit more about how best to prevent themselves from getting the infection. So they understand social distancing much better and wearing masks and uh, and that side of things. And maybe that's given them a bit more reassurance than they, that they had at the beginning over how to look after themselves and prevent them getting, themselves getting infected. And the only thing I would add is it's um, communication plays a key principle in the management of this disease. So like any infectious disease where you have to wear um, different layers of personal protective equipment, um, in the initial phases we, we were learning on how patients who were initially well actually in the February time um, could communicate with um, their relatives or with other people and as we went through the process our way of managing the communication either of our mobile phones and making sure patients that came in had their mobile phones their chargers through to the Institute of um, iPads and virtual means by which the nursing staff and also our colleagues could communicate with relatives in an efficient way so they could actually see their patient because we'd had no visitor policy in the trust um, and it was important for relatives to um, be involved um, in a more practical way. Um, thank you very much. A couple of people are asking whether, um, whether you've uh, had an experience managing pediatrics and neonates, and neonates or, and also adolescents for COVID-19 and um, whether there are any differences in terms of their management with the adult population and their recovery period. Is it different with the adult population or is it the same? So I think a disclaimer first. Uh, so we're all uh, adult infectious diseases physicians and we have a, a separate pediatric team uh, who would look after infections. And so none of us have been directly involved in the care uh, of either neonates, children, or, or young adolescents uh, with COVID-19. Um, having said that, I just as a, 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 a kind of a top line message, uh, the number of pediatric cases we had was in, absolutely minimal in, in, in terms of admissions to hospitals, so very few uh, children were, were getting admitted uh, with COVID-19, suggesting that, that A, infection risk was probably lower in children, and B, uh, that manifestations were less uh, severe because of age. Having said that, you've all seen reports of the Kawasaki uh, uh, syndrome type phenomenon uh, that some children get, and I have to say, uh, I personally know very little about that, so I wouldn't like to kind of... Uh, try and make a guess at what that is. Um, thank you very much for that response. Um, the other question I have um, is reg with regards to personal protective equipment that um, are being given to the healthcare workers. So what kind of, by um, the first C for care of COVID, is choose appropriate PPE. So 
how do you go about choosing the appropriate PPE? Who wears um, what? Do we use? Do you use surgical masks throughout, or are there N95s? And if they are there, which staff uses the N9 the N95? And so, what's like your criteria or protocol? I, th I think that's an excellent question, and the one thing that I've been trying to teach. Um, colleagues both when we were opening up some of the wards upstairs both from a healthcare perspective and nursing perspective is yes the PP is important and the personal protective equipment is important we've learned that we've gone from wearing full personal protective equipment like we would for some of our other high consequence infectious diseases to now wearing a mask um, potentially a visor um, and also gloves and an apron so the gold standard and the WHO obviously have the gold standard um, of care and Public Health England go with some of the WHO gold standard, but also go against it in some ways. But my main thing I would take home that we are wearing on the wards, we're wearing a surgical mask, apron and gloves and a visor is that it's how you use that equipment and the importance of donning is one thing but it's the importance of taking off that equipment properly and this is where people fall short with um, some of the equipment they're using um, and as we know it's a contact and air droplet spread um, and we have now moved from wearing a respiratory mask to wearing a surgical visor which a um, surgical mask excuse me and a visor and in the height of um, our kind of inpatient admissions where we didn't have the availability of some things, including visors and um, respiratory masks and things, we were wearing surgical masks, gloves and an apron. And what I would do is practically on the wards was going to be practical with the patient. So if I had a patient coming in, was sat on the ward coughing, and I could put a mask on that patient without them feeling uncomfortable, even with the nasal prongs and the oxygen on, I would do that as I went to examine them with the stethoscope that was kept in the room, which was cleaned before I used that on that patient. And I'd also ask them just kindly to move their head away from me as they're coughing, do as minimal contact time as possible when I went to examine them. But I would go and examine them and I would examine them properly. And that was an important part of understanding as we went along the difference between COVID-19, the difference between heart failure and the difference between bacterial pneumonia. So there is lots of guidance written down, but the guidance is only useful when you have practically the ways of getting that kit and equipment. Um, and obviously you can follow that guidance, but there are other ways you can do things to help you along the way if you don't have that availability of procurement. Maybe a follow-up question on that um, is, what's the incidence like, of healthcare worker infections um, in your facility? And um, yes, maybe you can comment on that. So, so this, was, uh, this has become a, a real bone of contention in, in uh, the UK public health and infection circles in terms of how much exposure do we think um, healthcare workers had on the front line and, and illness. So in any pandemic or, or epidemic that involves uh, a respiratory tract infection, uh, there is inevitably going to be some infection of your frontline workers. We, we've seen this in flu epidemics where up to 20% uh, of your uh, frontline uh, will get infected uh, with the, the influenza virus. Uh, so there have been some uh, serial surveys and some surveys in terms of nasopharyngeal swabs and surveys that have done a combination of the two uh, and on the whole, it seems like 30% or, or there or thereabouts uh, have had either uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic infections. At one stage during the pandemic, we probably had about 15 to 20% of our workforce uh, uh, away from work uh, because uh, they were unwell. Uh, and so this is, this is you know, a, a real issue in terms of a pandemic now. Having said all of that, the question that still remains that we haven't answered is whether these frontline healthcare workers got infected in hospital and whether that infection was from patient to healthcare worker or was it from healthcare worker to healthcare worker 
or did they in fact get infected out in the community where the virus was right? So that is something we don't have an answer to yet, uh, but it looks like, uh, you know, at, at the end of the first wave of the pandemic, at least a third uh, of frontline healthcare workers have been exposed uh, to COVID-19. Um, I can see, uh, quite a number of attendees have raised their hands. Kindly unmute yourself to ask your questions. Peter Kigo, Peter Nyeke, De Gracious, Lumbasi. Anthony Wanyoro. Yeah, thank you very much for a great discussion. I'm just wondering, uh, with the increase in antibody tests, which uh, shows that the person has uh, had past exposure and the query they may have uh, increased immunity. Uh, are you seeing risks of people uh, self-exposing themselves intentionally so that they can acquire these uh, antibodies? So that is a, a, a really interesting discussion. And in fact, uh, we were involved in a discussion maybe six, seven weeks ago, just as we were coming towards the end of the, the first wave of the pandemic, uh, where there was some discussions around whether people should have a COVID passport or not. This phenomenon that, you know, you have a passport that shows whether you're antibody positive or not, and that would allow you to do things that, that somebody who had not been exposed wouldn't be able to do. And I have to say, we were and still are completely vehemently against such a phenomenon because for exactly the reason that you point out, this is a, a perverse incentive for people uh, to think about getting exposed to, to a potentially dangerous infection. Now, you know, for most young people, this is probably not going to be a very severe infection, but nevertheless, there are some really big unknowns uh, about this and, and so uh, just as you say we would really want to keep away from this whole concept uh, of a COVID-19 passport of immunity. Um, a question from Jacqueline Kagima, is there a role in point of care ultrasound in the management of COVID-19 and in your setup have you incorporated these in the care bundle? So that's a really good question. So um, there is lots of work going on in simulation training and the, also the use of that simulation training practically both from the emergency department all the way through to um, on the ward care. And with the sort of advent of using ultrasound, obviously we need to think about how that ultrasound equipment gets cleaned appropriately in between patients, but it is a good modality. It was um, introduced and thought about by our, my renal colleagues for those patients that they were concerned about um, looking at the kidneys and seeing whether there was any obstruction or anything with the kidneys during the sort of height of the pandemic because it could be used relatively easy. And it's also used obviously in the ITU environment for putting in lines and um, thinking about the visualization of obviously the vessels as well. And in, in, in terms of uh, point of care tests for diagnosis of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, we don't have uh, a point of care test as such. We've just introduced gene expert, uh, which turns around samples in an hour, hour and a half. So this is starting to come through in terms of diagnostics for uh, COVID-19. Thank you very much. Um, maybe the last few questions before we end the session. Um, is on the issue of me mechanical ventilation. So from other presentations that we've had, um, mechanical ventilation, patients who are COVID positive and are put on mechanical ventilation have a poorer outcome. And, and there's the move 
or the discussion um, on CPAP and high flow nasal um, cannula oxygenation for patients. So in your setup, in terms of um, mechanical ventilation, um, what are the mortalities like and what have you seen that works in your setup? So I, I have to say the first thing uh, one needs to do is when you look at data of that nature, uh, you need to kind of think very carefully about whether the mortality is associated with mechanical ventilation or is it the, 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 the poor prognostic patients that are being ventilated uh, that results in the mortality. So I think it's really, really, really important uh, that that data is looked at very, very carefully. I have to say that uh, at the role free, our experience of mechanical ventilation uh, has been a really positive uh, experience in other words. Uh, we were one of the, 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 the kind of trusts uh, in London that were very keen on early mechanical ventilation as opposed to, to CPAP or, or high nasal uh, flow oxygen. And our outcomes as a result uh, have been better than any other intensive care unit in London. But, but this is because uh, we, were, we were choosing uh, patients to ventilate early rather than uh, delay ventilation. The risks with CPAP and high nasal flow oxygen is the onward transmission risk from aerosolization. And so one needs to balance between uh, mechanical ventilation uh, and, and the use of an intensive care bed and the number of ventilators you have versus the risk of uh, aerosolization with CPAP and high flow oxygen. Um, I think we have addressed most of the questions um, that are being asked. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay and your team for your presentation. Maybe right now I can give you an opportunity to um, give us your final comments, even as we end the session. So firstly, thank you all very much for having us on today. It's been a, a real pleasure. Uh, what we would like to do at some stage is to have you come back and speak to us so that we can learn from your experience uh, and see how uh, you are doing things at the Kenyatta and across uh, Nairobi and Kenya. Uh, and so we'll, 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 we will discuss and plan that uh, in, in the very near future. Uh, but just to say that we've come through the, the first wave, I, I gather you are just in the throes of, of your first wave. Uh, but uh, we hope that, that we can share some experiences that will be of benefit to, to all our patients. I'm going to specifically ask uh, Lucy to make some comments first and then Dom to finish off. Thanks. So if there's anything, I mean, my main comments relate to anything I can do to support or help from the point of view of learning from our experiences within the trust. Obviously, we work with a different cohort of patients with different comorbidities, but we've learned a few things from some of the practice, not just myself, but my colleagues. So if there's any information that would be helpful or the references or the um, information from the bundle, then I'd be very happy to send that on. And we've sent it to others amongst London and other um, organizations. Um, actually, I think one version went to New Zealand at one point. Um, and thank you for inviting me here to speak this afternoon. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and I would say, I suppose the most striking thing for me managing patients here is just how uh, distinctive clinical syndrome it appears to be, that even with a negative uh, PCR test, it can be quite obvious whether or not somebody has COVID. So it's quite, that's, which is quite a useful thing to do when assessing people coming through the door. Um, but, and then other than that, just thanks very much for having us. So thank you. And yes, we will share the care bundles. We've just seen a message about that. So we'll, we'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for your presentation. It's been a really um, eye-opener. And I know most of our attendees have actually learned a thing or two. To be able to um, get to learn also our experiences with managing COVID-19 um, for Dr. Sanjay and his team, feel free to join um, the webinar on Fridays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. East African time. I'm not sure what time it will be on your end. Mm -hmm. um, there we, we talk about our experience. Every Friday we 
we bring out our experiences with managing COVID-19 disease. Um, for the rest of us, um, can we note our presentations um, from, uh, for tomorrow and, and for Thursday? For Thursday, it will be in the evening and Wednesday will be on um, the guidance on continuity of mental health services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we, are, um, we are still working on the issues of the CPD points um, and most of them are being addressed. If you have any um, issues or queries, kindly email us at knhcpd at gmail.com. Otherwise, thank you very much. Um, hope to see you tomorrow from 2 to 3.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.